and welcome to Silux, the podcast where we talk about scientific developments and technological changes in Luxembourg. And in today's episode, we talked to Professor Stefan Bordas, Professor of Computational Mechanics at the University of Luxembourg. First of all, we asked him a little bit about the exact field he specializes in and also different other research projects he participates in. We talked a bit about buzzwords, about passion, about interdisciplinary approach and many other interesting things, even archaeology. I hope you really enjoyed this episode as much as I did, as usual, of course, and I wished I could talk more, but at the same time, he is a busy person, so I had to finish at a certain moment. Anyway, here is the episode. <laughs> Our guest today is Professor Stefan Bordas, a Professor of Computational Mechanics and the founder of Data and Computational Science Doctoral Program at University of Luxembourg. Thank you for accepting our invitation. Thank you very much, Hannah, for having me today. So, as usual in the podcast, what we first focus on is the basics. So we need to define and understand exactly what hides behind the special titles you have. So I want to understand, how would you define computational mechanics? What is that actually? So computational mechanics, uh, so there are two words in it. Uh, one is mechanics and the other is computational. So if we start with mechanics, well, mechanics englobes what people would understand as the deformation of objects under forces or the trajectory of objects subjected to fields such as the gravitational field. And computational means that we perform these computations, we solve these problems numerically using computers. And so that is why we are really closely working with mathematicians in order to write algorithms and with computer scientists in order to implement these algorithms in the most effective and efficient way. So what is also interesting to think about in that context is that mechanics is not only forces related to displacements. It's not only how much force do I need to apply on the brain in order to deform it by one millimeter. In other words, what is the stiffness of the brain? But there are also other let us say, environmental conditions such as temperature, irradiation, or other environmental conditions like humidity that you may want to take into account and that are also englobed into mechanics. So from that point of view, mechanics uses thermodynamics and the relationship between different quantities that are of interest to engineers. In short, the applications of what we do range from everywhere between biology biophysics at the single cell level to the organ level, um, as well as, of course, more traditional problems such as how do you build a bridge? What is its relationship to the environment? What is the effect of the wind? How can you harvest energy using the wind in an urban environment? How can you make tougher surfaces for tooling that uh, remain very sharp and very hard? And There are countless applications where we need to understand how a system behaves and how we can interact with the system, if possible, in real time. That would be the case for aerospace, for example. So mechanics is very wide. Computations are very wide. So I would say computational mechanics is a subfield of what is known as computational sciences, which is a global umbrella name, which is now merging with data science, actually, and we'll talk about it later, I believe. Uh, which um, is concerned with applying fundamental principles in mathematics, computer science, and computational engineering to solve real-world problems at the interface between different disciplines, usually. And so that's what keeps me going, because I, I think this is, you know, this um, this beauty at the interfaces is something that uh, that I find extremely motivating. Of course. Uh, and also, I was just thinking that it's, Basically, at the heart of uh, the moment when you are a child and you ask yourself a question, how does this work, right? And also, how does the world work? And how can this work if I add this or I change that, right? It's very much at the heart of everything, of understanding. And then also different disciplines, as you said. So, But what I don't understand is that it's terribly broad, then you have to specialize, right? And then you have a PhD student who comes to you and says, like, oh, I want to do this. And you have no clue about it. Or you just know everything. You can't, obviously. 
<laughs> uh, no, I don't think we are polymath exactly, although it would be nice to come back to the Renaissance times at some point. I think it's the, it's the right question to ask because in reality, what, what happens is that all these applications are only applications. And, you know, many people try to try to form a hierarchy of sciences and a lot of people put mathematics at the top and then you have physics and biology and of course everybody will will fight against this and I would be the first to fight against any sort of order in you know in the importance of sciences but from an abstraction point of view I think that you can almost always see a problem in another light and in another angle and what happens in computational mechanics is that you have 100 applications, but you have one model. And the model that you work on for years is going to be the common denominator between the different applications that you have. I could give you an example. When the, my PhD was in fracture mechanics, um, so people are aware of the DC-10 accidents when, when one of the propeller exploded and cut all the hydraulic systems in the plane, which means that three of the three hydraulic systems were cut off immediately by the explosions, which uh, led the plane to be unmaneuverable because there was no hydraulics left to do anything. So the elevator didn't work, the flaps didn't work, so nothing worked, and the plane had to be just crash landed, and that killed many people. And that was due to a micro crack that was in one of the uh, wings of the, this propeller. And um, of course, that is supposed to be seen by inspection. And in that case, it wasn't because of a human error. So the crack propagated, and it's a fatigue crack. It means that it propagates over time without you really noticing that it does propagate because you are not stressing the component above its ultimate ability to sustain load. You are loading it lower than its ability to sustain load, so it will not fail immediately. But every time you load it, even though you load it very low compared to what it can actually sustain, you are increasing the damage in the component, and that damage accumulates until the crack becomes so long that the uh, propeller simply breaks. And that is what happened there. So in that case, you can imagine that the crack is effectively, and this is a a bit of a technical term, a discontinuity in the displacement. Because if you go across the crack, you imagine that you're some sort of ant that's walking across the blade. And at some point, you see the crack. The crack is actually a huge gap, like you're trying to jump a canyon. And that canyon is a, a, a jump in the displacement field. You have a hole there. And if you consider what a surgeon does in the brain, so when they cut a, a tumor out, when they resect a tumor, they have to create this gap across which the a tumor can be actually removed. So they will create a hole around the tumor and they will resect the tumor out of the brain. So in order to solve both problems, the problem of a crack propagating in a propeller and the problem of a cut being performed in the brain, you need to be able to simulate processes that have jumps in it, that have ca these canyons that the ant has to jump above. And um, that mathematically happens to be done in many ways, yet you can understand that if you are able to solve that problem for an application of a crack, you may be able to take what you learned in that case and try to apply it to the other case of the cutting in the brain by a surgeon. So that's what we try to do. We try to isolate the common denominators between different applications and different problems in order to, let's say, do more with less, right? Because with one with one model, you can now solve not one problem, but 10 or 20 problems. So that's the power of abstraction. And that's why mathematics is so important, are so important in, uh, in what we do. So I, I hope it helps a bit. Uh, you, you started with mentioning that it, it was your PhD that you kind of made you jump from one subject to another. And I also would like to remind listeners that there is another podcast that you can listen to, uh, which is called Mine Element. And it's done by the Let's Boya Journal in cooperation with FNR, and where you talk a little bit about the fact that you had to jump very quickly. And the professor said like, yeah, well, it's almost the same, right? So so that's also good to, 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 to listen to and to check out. But I just wanted to ask, in that particular case or other cases, not your PhD, but in general, other applications, does it mean that you have to talk to the specialists of the field, in this case, uh, medical practitioners? Because, well, you can't, as you said, you can't specialize in everything. So it doesn't mean you're just trying to apply this rule to another field, but 
using the knowledge of other people, not that you start now being also a specialist in medicine. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. We, we are, the only thing we're specialists in is creating models of uh, what we see in the world around ourselves and uh, of systems that, that we create or that nature created for us, like the body, for example. And absolutely. So for, for brain surgery or liver surgery or any surgery of the knee, we worked in many disciplines, but in all, the, in all cases, it starts actually from the application. The people in the applied area, which we see as applied. So again, this is not to mean that one is superior to the other. It's just that um, from, our, for, from where we sit, we see it as an application. But you know, from a surgeon's point of view, this is not an application. This is their, their life and their, and their world, and they are saving lives this way. So when I say application, it's because I'm situating myself from the point of view of, um, of a modeler. So the modeler has models, and the models could be application independent, in fact. Uh, so when the applications come to to our minds, we we have to immediately start to understand what the application area has to tell us. So we we have to listen a lot and speak very little to be able to, in fact, hear the keywords that we need to appropriate and to try to understand what they actually mean. There is a lot of jargon that we don't know, so we need to learn a new language. And then we need to be able to explain what we understand internally, almost emotionally, because we feel, you know, certain things. It's very difficult to explain certain things unless you speak to your peers because they experience the life in the, and their world in the same way or similar. Uh, when you speak to someone who doesn't know your field, it's much more difficult. And so this is this dialogue that uh, I find is absolutely mind boggling and super interesting and vivifying and electrifying energetically i mean it's beautiful and that's the that's the really the most exciting part is trying to understand what the problem is half the time once you understand what the problem is you've solved it almost you know so and that's that, that is the that is what i find very yeah very motivating i would say so as you mentioned that what is more motivating for you the process of solving or actually solving the problem because there are different approaches right as some people say that it's more interesting to to chase the rabbit than catch it um, i think i'm one of those people uh, <laughs> i like uh, running a lot after endless pursuits that i know i will not be able to achieve i have to I have most of the time you know it's like pushing i think it's more like pushing yourself than it is pushing um, anything else, right? It's trying to see your, your limits and your boundaries. And once you see where those are, you need to, to try to push them even further. So I, I'm very interested in the process. Uh, yesterday, we had an interview with a PhD student who wants to join us. And I didn't ask any technical questions. I just asked this person what made him, in that case, uh, you know, what made him laugh, what made him happy, when did he get pleasure out of his work, what really made this eureka moment and from the answer i could glean as much information as from a hundred different technical questions that you could have rehearsed for and so i love that uh, that approach because you know yesterday we sort of improvised and this is what came out of the of the questions uh, at the end of the day and i think it it helps a lot to figure out what type of people we are dealing with and i think that in research one is looking for people who do not necessarily want to be right, but they want to have a genuine conversation with knowledge and science and other people. And they want to confront themselves to themselves and forget that they are in competition with others, really, because the real competition is, is with yourself most of the time. Oh, that's such an ideal world for the researchers that doesn't exist, right? I mean, we need to mention that you unfortunately have to be out also in the world and then check all the, you know, publications and then also, oh, yes, you are always compared in some way or another. Unfortunately, it would be great to be completely independent and then just, you know, do like you said. But yeah, who knows? Maybe one day we're going to get to that point. For now, coming back to more tangible discussions, because uh, you mentioned you defined the computational mechanics. And I just wanted to understand, is it possible to have mechanics without computations? Why is it computational mechanics? Is there just like plain mechanics or is it contrasted to theoretical mechanics? Or why do you add the computational there? 
I think it's a great question. So, so mechanics is super old, right? I mean, this is one of the oldest fields. You have Galileo Galilei, you have all, you know, everybody knows the stories. And you have Newton and then Einstein. And so these, that's the real physics, right? So this is physics and people, you know, have worked on that in order to write down theories that they then verified or, or validated rather using experiments and observations. And in that case, they use, of, of course, computations because they needed to, in fact, compute, you know, the trajectories of, of planets, for example. And this is also mechanics. But um, uh, the reason why we call these computational mechanics, um, at least in my opinion, is because we usually look at systems which cannot be solved analytically. So we, we look at systems where you cannot at least today, sit down and write down equations and then get what we would call a closed form solution, which can be written using uh, equations on a blackboard and that you would just look at the equation and you know the behavior of the system. So we, we cannot do that uh, because we are not mathematicians. And there are people in mathematics and in physics who will pursue that direction of trying to solve as complex a problem as possible by hand meaning that they do not want to use computers as much as they can. They would like to be able to solve it by hand. And this is their challenge. Their challenge is to look at the problem, simplify it as much as they can, but not too much, and solve it completely analytically by hand and get a solution, prove that it exists, first of all, that it is unique, if possible. Sometimes it's not. And then to find e either the solution or the family of solutions. In our case, we look at systems that are of engineering interest, usually. And these systems, like, you know, if you take an airplane, a DC-10 or whatever it is, you will never be able to write it. I mean, I should not say that because maybe, but let's say it's very unlikely that we are able to sit down and write all the equations and solve all of those by hand, simply also because there is a lot of uncertainty. We are dealing with engineering materials. We're not dealing with perfect crystals, for example, where the atoms are exactly aligned. So we would like to be, um, as opposed to more abstract, in that case, more concrete uh, compared to a mathematician who would sit down and write all the equations. So before I said that we would like to abstract away the model, but here the, the angle of approach is, uh, is quite different. We're trying to simplify, we're trying to generalize the, the case so that we can look at any arbitrary material which would be used in practice. So you know, when you make an aircraft, you may think that this is aluminum or composite, but in fact, the very composite or the very piece of aluminum that you have in the very aircraft that you're looking at is not the one that you can theorize about. It is this particular thing that you have in front of you with all these defects, as we talked about, and all these grains and polycrystalline structure and interfaces and so on. And these things, you, you, know, you can just not predict exactly where, where they are. What is their stiffness, their flexibility, their thickness? Um, you know, when they, they were created, what was the polymerization stage of the polymer and the crystalline phase or what. So it's very complicated. And that's why we are not mechanics people only, because mechanics people would sit down and write as simple equations as they can and try to solve them by hand. Uh, we are not completely engineers because we also don't necessarily build things. I mean, in fact, very rarely. Uh, personally, I'm completely useless at, at building anything. And even worse at doing experiments, which is something I want to learn. And so it is, it is in between, between engineering who needs concrete stuff, math who wants to be as abstract as possible. So in the middle is computational mechanics, trying to make a bridge between these, these two and sometimes other applications like medicine, and surgery, biology, uh, archaeology, uh, of, all, <laughs> of all things. Uh, we started a project on that recently. And so it's, it, that, that's what is actually fun, because we are neither one nor the other. We, we are at the confluence between the two. I understand this, this kind of being in between, which might, might be also difficult, because if you talk to the serious mathematician or the serious person on the other side, the engineer, they are like, hey, you know, it's a bit like you mentioned data science and data scientists. They're also a little bit in between. And then there is always this discussion, but that will always be there. Researchers will always try to find, you know, a way to explain that they are on top of the chain, right? And we don't want to get into that discussion because we don't want to discuss what's better, mathematics or physics or whatever else. But we definitely want to go to a very important part of our podcast, which is the pop quiz question. 
And then, of course, I want to remind everybody that the solution will be at the end of the of the podcast. And of course, listen closely because I think maybe we touched upon a little uh, the answer for this question. So, what is the question? Yes. Uh, so the question is: What is common between growing cancerous tumors and fracture propagation in aircraft? So that's what we're going to solve, as I said, at the end of the podcast. And I just wanted to have this question uh, put there because I want to move to a few things you touched upon that are just important. And first of all, you mentioned archaeology. Recently, I actually talked to uh, one of the researchers based here in Luxembourg at the Museum of uh, Natural History, and he is a paleontologist. So soon there will be an episode about that. And it's a really fascinating work. And for sure... There is also a lot of support from science. Actually, in his particular case, uh, science in the sense of computers, of course, and machines that are helping uh, archaeologists to find things and, and paleontologists too. But in his particular case, it's not that great because actually he has to really rely on, on drilling and, and digging. So just for our listeners who are interested in that, please uh, go check. It's going to be soon uh, online basically most probably before this episode in case you're looking for it but coming back to this what you mentioned so what's the uh, link between computational mechanics and archaeology in your case what kind of a project have you started um so that is uh, one of the most exciting projects that we're we are involved in at the moment uh, it started when uh, juan aguilar who is uh, luxembourgish uh, guy who uh, was absolutely uh, passionate about a site in Mosul, which is uh, the site of the prophet Jonah, where quite a lot of, let's say, religious trouble uh, took place over the, the years and the centuries. So everybody knows probably from uh, from the stories from the from the Bible, or at least it's quite well known uh, that there was this so-called prophet there um, and the story of the of the whale and so on, and so this is the uh, this is the place. And what happened is that uh, there was a, a church which was destroyed, a mosque that was built, and so on. And these things are destroyed and built uh, one after the other. And underground happens to be a neo Assyrian palace which was looted by the Islamic State repeatedly in order to sell small artifacts on the black market. And Juan went there and did some extraordinary work using drones that he built on his own, using rovers that he built on his own, and using some cameras that he mounted on the rovers. Uh, went underground, took some 3D reconstructed pictures of these places that had never been uh, looked at before, of the whole tunnel system that the looters had built, of the neo Assyrian palace inside, in the rooms where no one can go, but the rover could actually sneak in. Taking these 3D point cloud reconstructions allowed him to come up with an absolutely fantastic re reconstruction of the site. And now what we did is we applied with Juan and the University of Heidelberg for a, a project at the Institute of Advanced uh, Study, which was created by the Vice Rector Research, uh, Professor Jens Keisel at the University of, of Luxembourg, and uh, for what is called an Audacity project which allows people to work on extremely risky uh, research directions, which would never be funded by anybody else because the risk of failing is so high. So um, we are talking here risk, which is even higher than the European Research Council, which would be already very high risk. So we, we are really talking about things that are out there in terms of creativity and out there in terms of risk. So it is so so interdisciplinary that the time to, in fact, understand each other's language might well mean that the project is already doomed at the start, right? So what we are working on now is with Andrea Binsfeld, who is professor in uh, art history in um, the University of Luxembourg, with Juan Aguila and colleagues in Heidelberg. We are working with um, a computational mechanics person in, in our team, Pratik Suste, who is originally a mathematician, trying to reconstruct completely that particular site and do it in a mathematically rigorous way. Because what happens is that if you take drone pictures or rover pictures or, of um, places, you will get billions of points. So you have the surface, which is 
you know, you can do it in your iPad now or your iPhone. It's called LIDAR. And you can just take a representation of your room and then look at it virtually and uh, play with it later. Uh, the problem is these uh, representations have so many points that if you wanted to compute anything, so if you wanted to do computational archaeology, then you would need to definitely get rid of some of these points, presumably hundreds of millions of those points, so that you could actually do calculations. But the problem is, which points should you keep and which points should you remove? So basically data cleaning in some it's, way. Yeah, in some way. And it's a smart data cleaning in the sense that you have, we have, an approach which is based completely on applied mathematics, so it's, it's quite abstract, which allows you to know before running a simulation what will be the typical error that you will make. So what will be the quality of the simulation before even running the simulation? So this is the beauty of math, right? You don't even run it and you already know. So this, this is absolutely mind-boggling, right? I mean, you talk about, about that to people that do not know about this, they will have a hard time because it sounds like divination. But uh, it's definitely something that, that works. And what we want to do is to be able to compute the deformation of the palace, the mosque that was built, in order to try to have an idea using gravity, as a, this is the way that our team puts it, using gravity as a dating method, to try to figure out what were the loads that were applied on the Neo-Assyrian palace and on the ground. So we need geotechnical engineering, we need uh, some geological surveys as well in order to know what is there. So to compute what was the load in the past, so to try to reconstruct the series of events that led to the present by looking at the present uh, case. So it's like a rewind button. Go back into the past based on what you see in the present. It's a very difficult problem because it's, it's an inverse problem. You know the solution and you're looking for what caused the system to get into that state. It's like looking at the DC-10 uh, on a runway uh, with you know pieces 100 kilometers away being blown away by the explosion and trying to reconstruct the root cause of the uh, of the crash uh, this is something that uh, is done by you know forensics people and in that case this is you know one could think about it as some sort of archaeological forensics using computational uh, sciences it's super exciting Absolutely. That I did not expect. We just completely jumped into another field. And that, that really sounds uh, very exciting. I'm sure I'm going to be following if at all it's possible, right? Because it's going to be just going on behind closed doors of the scientists. But hopefully mm -hmm. we will one day read some amazing results of that project for sure. But you mentioned that and that just kind of inspired me for another question Everything you're doing is pretty interdisciplinary. So is it possible actually to be just completely stuck in your field and not try to go out of it in science uh, or not? I think in science it's definitely possible. In, in our field it's definitely not because, uh, in fact, maybe it is. Um, I, I think there are, yeah, I would take that back. I think it's possible even in, in our small fields to, to remain in that in that field and be and be doing only one thing and i think it's absolutely fine there was this uh, one of the key questions that i'm always asking myself and that uh, my students are asking themselves and asking me how do we know whether we are solving a problem which makes sense and should be solved you know so what is the intrinsic value of the problem that we are solving and how do we figure out whether we should tackle a problem or tackle another problem And I think it's quite related to your question of knowing whether you can be monodisciplinary or multidisciplinary. I think the beauty of about monodisciplinary work, and I think that happens a lot in, in mathematics and theoretical physics probably, although these two fields are multidisciplinary today by nature, um, I think being focused in computational mechanics, it could be someone working on the theory of, of shells, for example, and how these thin structures deform on the, on the load. You know, there are very many people working in that field, and it is quite a very self-defined field, which, as far as I know, you could, you know, study for years and years without getting bored and still having some very nice results. Contact mechanics is another example where you do not necessarily need to work with other people to be, uh, to be able to make progress. <clears throat> and there is a lot of progress at this, let's say, fundamental level, because I usually uh, think of, let's say, the work we do as more applied in a certain way, because we are talking to people that have real problems. We, you know, we do not make up the problems on our own. 
and we are not physicists or theoretical physicists or mathematicians. Therefore, we do not tackle, let's say, these big problems, you know, unifications of all the physical forces and, and so on. You know, this is not a problem we can tackle. So we are always in between. So I think for us, it's very difficult to be monodisciplinary, but it's still possible. I think it suits my own personality to be multidisciplinary, but it it doesn't mean that this is actually it's clear that it's not the only way to to do good work. And I think it's um, you know there was a letter by uh, Feynman to uh, Cushy, I think, uh, where Cushy had written to him before and apparently saying that he thought that his own career was no way near that of Feynman. I mean, of, of course, you're talking to. Uh, Richard Feynman is not like the average physicist uh, uh, in the playground. So, and then Feynman was telling him, you know, there is no such thing as a, as an unworthy problem. Uh, you, you can work on any problem. And uh, you, you know, Cushy was calling these problems humble problems, you know, problems that are not so exciting, I would imagine he meant. And Feynman was reassuring him, telling him that, you know, he could work on any problem as long as he were genuinely on the problem with all his energy and was giving everything he had to be able to, to solve it, that this was a worthwhile experience because it was producing some knowledge that could be accumulated and that others could build upon. So as long as the problem was addressed in a good way and in a genuine way, there was no such thing as a bad problem. And it's it makes me feel very good when I read this because... I often I ask myself questions. Are we really working on something that's really worthwhile? Why are, are we doing this? And it's not always obvious. So however exciting the, pro the projects might be, there is always this background voice telling you, are you really using your time in the best possible way for, you know, for humanity is a big word, but for society at least, or I don't know how to say it, but. There are so many points to touch upon in the, what you just said, uh, but I think it's really important and interesting to see that a person that is doing something that is more, you know, STEM related and mechanics and more tangible for the common good, let's say, is saying that because, you know, I have a background in, in, in linguistics and languages. And there was a moment when I was thinking about uh, doing PhD studies and all that. And one of the things that I had to tackle is that the reaction of the society often was like, yeah, but you know, what's the point? I was like, well, this is a problem. I'm going to solve it. This is interesting. This is might lead to something. But unfortunately, in humanities, you more often, in my opinion, face that problem of, yeah, why? Right? I think, and that's something you have to fight. And also, in general, there are more programs promoting STEM and more people kind of looking at that rather than, you know, I think any science is important. We can't compare it. We can't say what, whether finding the exact reason why we're using this tense there is more important than what you're doing. It's just, you know, as you said, solving problems, right? That that just make us go further and who knows how important they will be later on. So this is great. You've mentioned that and I'm going to definitely share it with a, a guest of mine soon because we'll be talking about linguistics and science as well. So important thing to remember. So one more thing, uh, because you mentioned it a little bit, and I think it's also good to look at that. Uh, you mentioned data science, right? So it's a bit of a buzzword, also something that interests me personally. I've discussed it already on the podcast, and it is also, well, the name of your of your doctoral program, right? Because it's data and computational science. So first of all, my question is, uh, is it something that is too fashionable? Is it something that we've been doing already and now we just are naming it and everybody is jumping on board? Or also from the perspective of machine learning and the fact that, you know, not in my opinion, all the problems are solvable by computational prediction using machine learning in the sense that, as you're saying, you can simulate something and you can get results, but we are always talking about quite a high number of error, at least now. At least that's how I understand it. So cool if we're applying it to face recognition. I mean, depends how cool, because depends what you're using it for. But in general, that is still kind of acceptable, let's say. But it's not so cool if we're applying it to, I don't know, airplanes, right? And and certain predictions of, of how they work. Or, I don't know, uh, driverless cars. 
What, what, what do you yeah. think about that? What is the marriage here and what is the approach? Yeah, I mean, uh, the question is so um, wide and exciting. I mean, uh, I think we could talk about it for, uh, for hours and hours. I'll try to be, to be organized in my response. So your, uh, one of the points that you made is about the error um, and, and the fact that we are using tools to solve problems that will have an impact on human beings. So if we take the example of the, of the aircraft industry, for example, we have, you know, if we started flying now, we could fly for 20,000 years without having any accidents. So, you know, if we, we were able to stay on one airplane for 20,000 years, of course we are not, but um, statistically speaking, um, the, the, the likelihood of having an accident is so low that, um, and, and usually it's due to human error, actually. So, so, so that we are doing well. I mean, I think in engineering, we know how to, to make things work. I mean, Elon Musk and what he's doing with SpaceX just shows how beautiful it is, uh, how we can you know, really make things happen. But we're in Luxembourg after all. So that's one thing about errors. And I think what you're saying about data science being a, a buzzword, I completely agree. I, the way I see it, and this is really, this became obvious to me when I met uh, Professor Christoph Ley, who is now a statistician in the University of Luxembourg. He joined recently. And uh, we worked together on a, um, on a small article um, because we were on the same panel discussion once that was organized uh, in the University of Luxembourg, oh my goodness, a long time ago. And um, so we wrote this and the title was whether basically data science is a revolution or not. And is it just statistics 2.0 or is there something else behind it? And of course, you know, the, the truth lies always in the middle somewhere. So essentially what, uh, what we are saying is that we are all concerned with modeling. So we are trying to look at the system, at the world, at the body, at an aircraft as a simplified version of what it really is. If we look at a map of the earth, flat map, this flat map is a wrong representation of the real earth, which is round. And we pro when we project it on a map, you, you know, the Mercator projection is doing some error. The cylindrical projection, the spherical projection, whatever projection you're using, conformal, not conformal, you will always have some errors because it is a model. And a model, by definition, is a simplification of a real system, which exaggerates certain features in the projection case, you will maybe increase angles at certain areas. You will increase areas in certain regions so that Europe looks huge and the US looks small, you know, which makes us look bigger. Or vice versa, you know, you put Russia in the middle and you see Russia is huge. And then if you turn the, the thing around, you see US is huge. So it depends where you make the projection. And you can therefore increase certain features and traits of the model uh, compared to reality. And then you have, uh, so that, that is why all models are wrong, uh, but some are, are useful. This is what George Box uh, was saying. And this is the, the key thing. We are always making simplifications, always. And I think there are two ends of the spectrum uh, in order to make these simplifications. One end is the purely mathematical modeling angle, in which case you do a bit like Newton, you observe, what you see, and you say, oh, it seems like everything is falling down. Maybe this is universal, and maybe all the planets are actually falling down upon it themselves, and this is why they are rotating, and this is the logic behind. This is universal. This is the law of gravity. You postulate something. You write it down as equations, and as long as it's not put into question by Einstein in that case, it remains right. So, um, that's what you do. You write models, they are wrong, it's okay. You use them until you see when they are right and when they are wrong. And when you know that, you know when you can apply and when you cannot apply the model. That's, that's as simple as that. And some models are written by equations and others are, this is the other end of the spectrum, dictated by statistics. So they can be, when I say dictated, I mean modeled by statistics. So you have a continuum spectrum of models that start at the equation level uh, in which case you can write actual equations down that describe the system. And at the other end of the spectrum, you will have cases where you actually cannot write equations because simply the problem hasn't been 
thought about in uh, as much detail as uh, you could have thought yet. Maybe it will. Maybe someone will be able to write an equation about what is the probability that someone entering a bar will take a picture containing a Coca-Cola logo, for example. Maybe someone can write one day an equation on this. But at the moment, people are using the data that they glean from Instagram or from whatever social platform they use in order to find this probability and help the brands make sure that they position their products in the right place inside the coffee shop, for example, or the bar, or whatever they are uh, expecting people that they want to target go to. So these two extremes are, I think, the very exciting point where we are now in modeling, because my end of the spectrum is the first end where you can write equations down and you describe uh, the equation and you solve the equation as fast as possible, computational mechanics or computational sciences. And the other end is data science, where you have only data, but you don't necessarily have a closed form model. So what you do is you have a statistical model. This is what Christoph Ley is doing at the university, for example. And in between, you have this very rich turf where people can work between engineering, mathematics, statistics, and applications where the two ends meet. And this, I think this is the exciting bit because then what will happen is that you will write an equation for, let's say, the aircraft, but this equation is bound to be wrong because, you know, of course you have equations assuming these materials are to some level perfect, that they do not have these impurities that led to the failure and death of so many people in the DC-10. Uh, that they um, all the materials are maybe homogeneous or simplified. There are perfect lattices. So you have to make some simplifications. But then you build a real aircraft. And as we said, you build a real aircraft. It has nothing to do with the aircraft that you have in your computer in the first place because there are lots of uncertainties. So what do you do? Well, you monitor the aircraft. You put some strain gauges. You put some measurement devices. You measure temperature loading, opening of the crack. You, you can do a lot of measurements today. And you can do a huge amount of measurements today, in fact, because you have Internet of Things with 5G and so on that is coming up. So you can, in fact, generate huge amounts of data. And that data can be used to do what? Well, to modify the initial model that you had in your computer that you thought was describing, like Newton thought he was describing the universe. He was to some extent, but someone else came later and said, yeah, almost, almost, uh, dear Newton, but not exactly. So uh, Isaac then would have had to go back to his uh, drawing board and do something better. And now here we're talking about a complicated system like an aircraft. It's exactly the same. We have equations that are right, written down. Then we observe, and we observe in real time now because we can. And we can update this model so that then we can interrogate this model and ask it, oh, can we fly the airplane again or is it going to crash like the DC-10 did? And then that, that helps us tremendously to avoid mistakes, avoid errors, and increase the certainty in the calculations. Although, of course, there is always error, and this is what we call uncertainty. And if you think of the uh, uh, Marquis de Laplace, uh, he was basically saying that if we could understand the initial condition of everything, and we could understand all the intermediate steps that this everything went through, then we would be able to predict without any uncertainty the state in which it will be at any time in the future. So that what we could not predict was what he called uncertainty. And, and this is what uh, then the whole theory of, of probability and, and statistics came uh, to, to be able to support in everyday life, in calculations, and, and so on. So that, that's the way I would answer that. It's a long-winded answer, but it's also a very complex question. And also, you know, I think it will change the answer the moment those two fields you were talking about, two approaches, start kind of getting closer because I'm sure they will in some way or another, right? So we will see how it all evolves. We don't know yet, but the future is bright, as I like to say always. And unfortunately, the future of our episode is not so bright because we have to kind of finish already. And I need to make you answer the question because if not then the listeners will be very, very disappointed. So I hope you still remember it. So if you can repeat what the question was and then tell us the answer. Yeah, the question was, what is common between modeling the growth of a tumor, a cancerous tumor, uh, and uh, the propagation of cracks in airplanes? So at the beginning of the podcast, we talked about what is common uh, between a crack propagating and cutting in, inside the brain. Uh, so crack propagating for a little ant moving around will be a huge chasm. It will be the sort of crater or, or canyon. 
uh, this is a jump. And when you're modeling the growth of a tumor, you are modeling the interface between two different environments. One is the tumor, which is made of cells, an extra polymeric uh, matrix. And the rest around is, let's say, tissue, which is not cancerous and therefore uh, sane, right? And so this interface is, again, uh, one sort of crater or uh, discontinuity, but it is not like uh, the Grand Canyon now. It is just a change in slope. So it's like you're imagining that you are running across a mountain, which I do frequently in trails, and you run up and suddenly the slope increases and that you have like one point at which the slope really gets steep. And this is when you enter the tumor, for example. And this is something that, that is very common in uh, mathematical modeling, where you have interfaces between two fields, two mathematical fields, not two scientific fields. And that happens in aircraft as well, because people use composite materials in aircraft. So in aircraft, the tumor would be the composite fiber, and the matrix around would be the polymeric, uh, the polymers that's around. So you, you know sometimes that you are using carbon fibers in uh, polymeric composites. So these carbon fibers are very small. That would be the analogous uh, part of the tumor. And the surrounding is the polymer. And the polymer is um, has another material property, which makes this kink, what is called a kink, a change in slope that you feel when you run up a mountain. So these two things are, of course, related. And this is why when you work on composite materials and you are able to model these uh, very complicated uh, systems, you are also in a good position relatively to start modeling completely different things, uh, which are these uh, cancerous tumors. So it was an oversimplification, as all models are, but um, yeah. I yeah, no, you must have struggled a little bit with all the simplification in this podcast, because, of course, if you were not simplifying, you would not give me any answers today, I think. So thank you for that. And also thank you so much for a very interdisciplinary interview. Uh, it was music to my ears because you basically mentioned almost all the subjects that I managed to discuss with all the other interviewees in the podcast. So there was data science. I talked about data science, 5G. There was a guest about 5G, paleontology, basically everything. Space, We I've discussed space because, of course, we're in Luxembourg, right? So, you know, brilliant. I did not ask it. If any of the listeners are like, oh, maybe they staged it. No, we did not. It's just perfect <laughs> because all the different interests kind of converged and were mentioned. So thank you for that a lot. And as usual, I just wanted to mention one more thing that I will try to share in the show notes all the links to the things we discussed. So the article you talked about, about data science and everything else. And we haven't managed to talk about the legato team as such, some of the work, but not define it. And we haven't talked about a lot of other things. So if you are interested, everything will be in the show notes so you can check. And of course, you can also check uh, Stefan's um, social media presence. And I'm sure he'll be able to answer some of your questions if you have additional ones, although you have to wait because... From my own experience, you never know when you're going to get the answer. He is very busy. As you can see, he's doing a lot of different things. So once again, thank you very much for today, Stefan. Thank you very much, Hannah. It was really a pleasure. And if I can end with a citation from Rumi, uh, who is a philosopher, I would say, hope to you know entice others to do. Like this, set your life on fire and seek those who fan your flames. And that's where I'd like to end. Perfect. It's a pity you didn't tell me in advance. I could have even quoted it maybe in the original, but good. I'm not prepared, so I can't do that. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, and thank you for listening. Thank you very much. And this is it for today. I hope you enjoyed the episode with Professor Stefan Bordas. He is a really charming and interesting guest, isn't he? If you enjoyed the show, check other episodes, uh, follow us, subscribe, uh, check what we write about on Twitter, on Facebook, on LinkedIn. We talk about science and developments in Luxembourg and also other interesting things. And yes, uh, tell others about us or maybe just suggest some guest or question or topic of discussion. We are always open to your comments. This was Silax and my name is Hanna Siemaszko.